We are talking today with Judith Very Baker. Judith Very Baker is an American artist, writer, and poet. She first became known as a young prodigy in cancer research, then later for her assertion in 1999 that while conducting cancer research in New Orleans, in the summer of 1963, she had a love affair with Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused assassin of President John F. Kennedy. And she is here to talk about her book, Me and Lee, How I Came to Know, Love, and Lose, Lee Harvey Oswald. Judith, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us today. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So start out, uh, tell us, what was your motivation in writing Me and Lee? Well, um, in 1999, I finally spoke out after realizing that many lies had been perpetrated and were still being perpetrated about Lee Oswald being the assassin when I knew better. I knew this man. I had been his constant companion during not daytime, not not in the evening or anything like that. But uh, for example, um, we met in April 26, 1963, and we were hired by the same small sub company the same day, called Standard Coffee. A lot of people never knew that. Uh, it's something that was kind kind of hidden, and of course I knew that the, the records were there. There are only like two records that show that in the whole Warren Commission thing. We have Jack Ruby's mother's teeth, but we don't have anything about the fact that Lee and I rode the same bus for 11 weeks every single day. We only lived a few blocks apart. That is only one bus stop apart that we were hired the same day at the small sub company. And on top of that, one week later, we were transferred to a larger company, Riley Coffee. Uh, We had about maybe 95 maybe 100 employees, still not that big. That was the same day. Then, for example, the day that Lee was fired there, I, they put an ad in the paper. They ordered an ad at the time speaking to replace me. I, the ad uh, wasn't worded quite right, so they had to put another one in. I was training someone. I was supposed to stay until the end of August, and at that time I would uh, be replaced. Unfortunately, they fired me on August 9th because that was the day I was seen with Lee prior to his being arrested. He was arrested for handing out pro-castoral literature. Now, he was supposed to hand out pro-castoral literature because he was working with Guy Bannister, former FBI agent who was uh, associated with the FBI in New Orleans trying to find uh, pro-Castro spies that were coming in because this was a port of entry. Castro spies were coming in because a lot of anti-Castro people were working there in New Orleans. And, for example, they had a training camp out at Lake Pontchartrain. And they were the Castro spies were trying to infiltrate the training camp to see who was against them, of course. Lee's job was to hand out pamphlets, not only the ones we see on films on August 9th and then a week later, but also he did this um, a couple months earlier. And in each case, um, I can document why he did this. For example, a lot of people don't understand that, well, why do you see this man who's just panning out pamphlets? Why is he on film? Why is he that important? You had demonstrations going on all the time in New Orleans. It was, you know, segregation, this, that, and the other. Well, Bannister, really, they set up pictures. They wanted uh, photographs. You know, they were taking photos of people who were taking these flyers and not discarding them. It was quite paranoid back then. You're talking about six months after the Cuban Missile Crisis. You're talking about Fidel Castro having aimed his nuclear-armed missiles at the United States. And Kennedy stopped that, you know, along with Khrushchev. It was a very dire period. And now we have Castro's uh, people infiltrating all the way into South America, Central America, and people like Riley Coffee Company, for example. They didn't want their uh, coffee beans disrupted. They didn't want their sugar products, you know, uh, in trouble. Already, uh, the United States was no no longer getting any sugar, of course, from Cuba. And Standard Fruit, which was located in New Orleans, they lost their wharf and and all their shipping between Cuba and the United States uh, into New Orleans. So we have the trademark. The very first international trademark was built there in New Orleans with a sister um, organization started in California. And, of course, now... We know about the trademark at the World Trade Center and what happened there. Trademark seems to always be be involved in some things that are pretty bad for America. It really needs to be looked into. Jim Garrison did just that, and he indicted Clay Shaw, who was one of the managing directors of the 
trademark. And um, unfortunately for him, you had the FBI and the CIA and everybody else blackening his name, uh, making it impossible for him to do a, a really good investigation. Clay Shaw was, was uh, jury let him go in no time at all. But a wonderful thing happened. Garrison also brought out the Zapruder film. That film shows Kennedy's head violently thrown backward, but Lee Oswald was shooting, they said, at him from behind. Now, we have Dan Rather on record. A man came from New Orleans. He was a newspaper reporter. He went pretty high because he was rewarded for saying some pretty interesting things. He said he saw the film that the United States, uh, for some reason, uh, you have others like the Warren Commission never got to see. They never got to see the film, okay? But that film, he got to see it. The American public didn't get to see it until the Garrison inv investigation. And maybe a few people saw it, but the people in general, the American public, did not see this film where Kennedy, you can tell he's being thrown violently backward, uh, back into the, the left, I guess, is the way it's always described. Rather, as out of breath, he runs, he says, I've seen the film. <sighs> like that, he said, I saw Kennedy's head violently thrown forward shot from behind. And that went everywhere. Other things about Lee Oswald went everywhere. For example, they said, we have found a map in his, in his Berkeley, uh, 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 excuse me, where he was living in the, in the rooming house there, okay, on Beckley <laughs> Avenue. And we have found a map and it shows the trajectories. It shows he was going to shoot from, you know, all these lines. Two days later, hidden down way low in the paper, okay, you have to look for it. It says the map doesn't really exist. Yeah, so you have all of this stuff going on. There is so much of it. Demonizing Lee Oswald. There are pictures of with this funny grin. I have blown those pictures up to show people. When we go, we're going to be going to, um, I want to get this uh, where we're going. We're going to the Seattle um, the press conference at 10.30 a.m. Um, on the 20th. And then we're going to be at the convention center in room 201. Um, I'm going to show people just exactly how they framed Lee Oswald. And I'm going to tell them a lot more about, about my story with Lee. So I'm, I know I kind of digressed here, and so I hope you can pull me back in to what you uh, would like me to say about Lee. And, but I, I really want people to know that a lot of lies have been out there. Who had the power to do that? Who had the power to do that? I know that Lee was busy trying to help us, the United States government, rein in Fidel, Fidel Castro. He was trusted by a lot of the pro-Castro people because he had been sent as a fake defector to the USSR. And he was promoting uh, himself, you know, as, as uh, over there, uh, he defected. Well, how come he came back? And how he came back is most interesting. You have a man, I'm going to show you an example today. You may have heard this elsewhere, but it's, it's telling. You know how we're not very happy with Iran right now. And you can imagine if we had someone come in, they say, look, I know all this material about drones. And I'm going to go over there and I'm going to show them how to shoot it, shoot them down. And I'm going to throw my passport down right here and I'm going to declare this to you. I am giving up my American citizenship and out I go. I'm going to Iran. Do you think they'd let him out of the building? Well, they let Lee Oswald out of the American embassy building in Moscow to do exactly that to go and give information about the U-2 and all kinds of radar installations. They had to change all the codes. Yet this man comes back all, more than two and a half years later. His passport's still waiting for him right at the embassy. They hand him his passport. They give him a loan through an agency that's connected with the U.S. government to come home with a Russian wife and a baby. He wouldn't leave his baby behind. Part of the reason that um, I get a little upset when people... They don't like to mention, well, here we've got this man. He's over in Russia, you know, and he comes back. They never mention, oh, he never got arrested, you know. And yet, why? If this man was such a danger, why was he not on the list of people to be watched in Dallas? Because he never was any kind of threat to Lee. Lee was never a threat to Kennedy. They took a photograph, and a lot of people don't know this, of Kennedy off his wall at his rooming house. You know, it's, it, and we have lots of things in the evidence files that you never hear of, a Minox spy, spy camera. They later say that that spy camera was a light meter, Minox light meter. But if it was a light meter, why did 
Officer Rose opened it up, and he testified he pulled film out of it. So why? The Minox, I saw it myself. And he took pictures of it because we didn't have Xerox machines back then. He could take photographs with a Minox, and that thing was smaller than a bar of candy. He could keep it in his pocket, and nobody knew. And he, you know something else he did? I watched him. He developed his own films. He had a fancy cameras. He had a 3D, 3D camera. could make three-dimensional pictures, yes. But they have him with this cruddy plastic, real cheap um, camera that's supposed to have taken these backyard photos. He had his, supposedly had his wife do this, okay? And you look on the back, and anyway, it, you find out that these photos were processed at a store. Just like, very, they didn't apparently know that Lee processed his own film. Those backyard photos were processed in a store. So what's going on here? Well, somebody, I think, planted that camera because the police didn't find it. They had these photos, and people said, well, where's the camera? We don't see his camera. We've got fancy cameras here. Well, what do you know? A couple of weeks later, it shows up in the garage where the police have been over and over combing it. Somehow they missed this camera this high in the garage, among other things. Kind of like the way they found the silver bullet. I'd like to say one, one more little thing about mm -hmm. how he's uh, uh, really framed, just to give you an example. The, they, Hoover was saying he was a homosexual. I think they didn't want him to know, uh, the public to know that he might have had a girlfriend like me. Believe me, he was not a homosexual. He had two little kids just from a, a, a very young marriage and everything else. When he was arrested, they took hair samples. They put a chunk out of his hair here. They got off his arm. They got off his chest. I have the police records for that. And they shaved his pubic area. And then Hoover said, look, they shaved his pubic area. He must be a homosexual. Okay? Then they find pubic hairs on this blanket. The blanket, they say, that held the killer rifle. And in the Warren Commission report, and you can see these strands. Here's... Two, they look like black pencils. Here, here. Those are the ones from Lee Oswald when he, they cut off of him. These were found on the blanket. They are so fuzzy and everything, you can't see anything. Nor can you see the ends. If a, a blanket would have pubic hairs on it, you wouldn't have Lee Oswald sitting there shaving them off of him onto the blanket, right? Okay. But you can't see the ends. They just show the, the strands. They don't show the ends. A natural one would have a bulb on the end. They don't show any. You don't see any bulbs. Because if you, you know, if something falls out or breaks off, it'll have a curl on the end. Nope, we don't have any of that. You know, all we see are these strands, and they're very, very poorly printed on porous paper. And they say, look, they match. <laughs> this, is, this is from Lee Oswald when he was shaved. And these were found on the blanket. What they don't tell you there that there are even other pubic hairs and, and other hairs on the blanket that didn't belong to Lee Oswald. Here's the reason. That blanket went through the washing machine and dryer at Ruth Payne's house. She's got Michael Payne there, Ruth Payne. You've got Marina. You've got two little kids from the Paynes and a baby and Lee Oswald. You have seven people there, and you're going to have hairs on that blanket from something because they were being washed there. The blanket was supposed to have had the, the rifle inside, and it was supposed to be, there it was right on the floor in full sight. For some reason, it's sitting there for like, they say, two months in the garage, on the ground. Dirty ground. There's, there are wood shavings everywhere. It's a, a place where she said she was making blocks for her children. Somehow didn't notice this rolled up, you know, blanket here with a rifle inside. But very interestingly, and I have it at Lola for JVB for LHL. And those are number fours on YouTube channel. And we call it the um, Granny Knot. Because the blanket is tied, was tied on both ends with, to hold the rifle inside, supposedly, with granny knots. Now, granny knot is what the Marines tell Marines never to make. Of course, Lee was a Marine. Granny knots are what women use to tie kids' shoes, and they all come loose again. So it's not a, a very secure knot or anything like that. And it's what women use more than anybody. Most, if, you know, if you're eating, if you're a man, you're not eating quiche, you're not making granny knots. Okay, so here's this blanket, and you, you look at the blanket in the National Archives. There's not one speck of dirt on that thing. Another interesting thing is Ruth Payne, who lived there, uh, brought the police in. She said, we're expecting you. They ask, uh, do you know if there was a rifle here or anything? And she says, well, let's go into the garage. She talks 
in Russian to poor Marina. They go in there, and she, the, the, it's sitting there, this blanket. She goes over and steps on it. That proves there's nothing in it. How did she know? All right, so you have all these problems. You're going to find a lot more stuff in here, but also my personal relationship with Lee and what we were doing in New Orleans, trying to kill Fidel Castro, because he was somebody that uh, the U.S. government wanted eliminated. So did the mafia. Lee Oswald was not only associated with the CIA and the FBI, he was also, his uncle was mafia. Closely related, was an enforcer for Carlos Marcello on the docks. Lee spent so much time with his uncle, he even lived with him part of the time when he was in New Orleans. So the mafia and the FBI and CIA at this time were working together to try and eliminate Castro. Lee was someone who could be on both sides. So tell us, how is it that you ended up in New Orleans? All right. Uh, The book will tell you a great deal about how I was, um, I I wanted to cure cancer. It was my passion. I wanted, and I had real intelligent parents. My father worked, um, he was an electrical engineer, and he invented some uh, components for, for televisions. I built my first TV set when I was 10 years old. I had a lot of interest in science always. When my grandma died of cancer, that, ter- that piqued me. And I wanted to, very much to do what I could. I had uh, obtained cancerous fish, and I met a great cancer researcher. His name was Dr. Alton Oxner, and I would meet him again. Okay? But he encouraged me, and I was, being, um, I was in contact with someone whose name was Knut Mickelson. And Mickelson was a Hitler um, an agent against Hitler in the World War II. He was a geneticist working with radiation. He, came, he visited my school. We have all the newspaper articles about it. And they introduced me right away because I was already doing experiments with these cancerous fish. And he was a geneticist working with cancer. So he uh, talked to me. He was impressed. He got uh, Colonel Philip Doyle, who um, was teaching. I was in, taking some of his classes there, and some retired... Um, Military officers, Doyle was from West Point. This is a a town filled, Bradenton, filled with um, military officers who retired and so on. And Michelson had connections with Oak Ridge. And soon, on top of that, I got other connections. So I'm I'm being sent materials. And part of the reason I'm being sent materials to, to work on my cancer research is when I was 16, I developed a new modified way to get magnesium out of seawater. And I went right up to the International Science Fair with that. It was, um, it was a modification to remove platinum from a, a process that had been developed in Germany. And the U.S. government was sort of interested in that. This is the Cold War. They're, they're trying to get lightweight magnesium products uh, cheaper, you know, to everything from uh, trying testing them on rockets to many other uh, subjects. Um, for example, if you're going to have a lighter, if you want to uh, clad, aluminum was very important, and magnesium was even more important because it was so lightweight. So it, is, it was um, a tactical material that they were interested in. So when I was up in Indianapolis, um, all of a sudden I, I brought my materials along about uh, what the work I was by now doing with mice. And they saw that, and I got even more help, okay? I mean, it just poured in. And so now I'm down in Florida, and they're scared because I have given mice cancer. I mean, um, I was working with doctor, uh, rather some doctors who I have the records. They were trained at Oak Ridge, overseen by the CIA. And I show that in the presentations, okay? And not just one doctor, but at least two of them. And there were others. So I'm uh, trying to give mice cancer because my dream was to see if I could impede, stop cancer from spreading, from uh, migrating elsewhere in the body. Because at that time, if, and it's still true, if you remove a cancerous tumor, okay, if it's not encapsulated, you're going to have my, uh, metastases. It's, it can spread. And I thought by injecting anti-radioactive steroids under these cancers, if they were zapped them with radiation, it would, could kill any mitotic activity when the uh, cancerous tumor is being removed. My problem was is I had to have cancer. I had to have mice with cancer. I worked with a wonderful um, 
bacteriologist who came from Notre Dame. My, my family is, I was born in South Bend. We had many connections to Notre Dame. And so what happened is he helped me. He got me germ-free mice. We, they already had no immune system whatsoever. You know, you had to keep them in, in pretty uh, sterile conditions and everything like that. And using um, a specifically designed, I designed a carcinogenic compound made from cigarette butts. My friends were gathering cigarette butts from all over the town, you know, and we finally, I finally got it. I gave cancer, lung cancer, to mice in seven days. They had never done that anywhere. And I had the materials. I had my records. I had my log books. I had my histological specimens. I had everything in the photographs. And I crashed the science writer seminar, the fourth one. It was held in St. Petersburg, Florida. It was only two, 22 miles away. And I had to lift my skirt and show my leg to get a bus to stop to get me across, you know. But I went over there with a, a press pass from my high school and entered in there between two reporters just as they're shutting the door. The reporter sat down and he realized there was not a seat in that place and there's all, there are all these august doctors, the cancer research specialists, the best in, probably in the world. You had Dr. Harold Deal there, the vice president of the American Cancer Society, lung cancer expert. That's why I wanted to go, okay? In charge of research and giving grants, all right? He's in the newspaper with me. He, you know, they came to my school. You have Dr. George E. Moore, the director of the Roswell Park Institute for Cancer Research. It's now called the Roswell Institute. He's the head of the whole thing. I eat lunch with them, you know. The, who are the others? We have Dr. Harold Urey, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, and Dr. Robert Robinson. It's Sir Robert Robinson because he got knighted by, by the Queen of England and he's a Nobel Prize winner. They're looking at my materials. They go to my school. They call a doctor I'd met before, and that was Dr. Alton Oxner. He flies in. So I've got these three doctors. These three doctors had often testified together at when they're, uh, they were trying to sue the tobacco companies because it causes lung cancer when you smoke. Okay? So these three doctors know each other, like each other, and they're together. And that just skidded, uh, the grease the skids, I'll just put it that way. Because the next thing I know, I'm getting world-class training at Roswell Park. I'm learning how to handle the SV40 monkey virus, the friend virus, the root virus, HeLa, you name it, uh, the, the different. Uh, and I was helping, um, I was also interested in bacteriophage research. And I learned how to handle, uh, identify the changes that come into cells when they're damaged by radiation. In the newspapers, it says that, you know, I had chan oh, I had so many scholarships, and I could go anywhere I wanted, but I wanted to go back to my native Indiana. And I, it was too late for me to make uh, University of Chicago. I, had, I didn't even make any applications for any of my colleges. They just poured in, and I didn't realize uni that University of Chicago, uh, you had to make an application. So I wanted to go the first um, couple semesters or so to a small college, St. Francis College, because they promised I could continue my work with mice and everything like that. And we have a paper that I presented in Indiana to a professional association there. Um, that's in my presentation. You'll see I was working with melanogenesis, mal uh, malignant melanoma, human melanoma that had been um, trans and had been actually. Uh, transferred into hamsters, and it was the 73rd generation I was working with. Very potent stuff. In the newspapers, you'll see that these doctors who were mentoring me, these people who were, were advising me and guiding me, I'd been assigned to try and make cancer more deadly. Now, that is completely the opposite of what I was wanted to do. I wanted to cure cancer. These people... We have Dr. George Moore in the presentation I, I, I will be doing at the convention center. I, I mentioned how um, Moore is, has, there's a newspaper article where it says, we shouldn't tell people that we're injecting them with cancer when we're experimenting with them. If we do, we won't have anybody volunteer. This is the kind of mindset we, we were working with. Go ahead and inject people with cancer to see if it's going to make give them cancer. Don't tell them. So I have the records on all this. These are the kind of things that were going on. That was Dr. Moore. Dr. Oxner is on record as having worked with prisoners 
at the Jackson Mental Hospital, okay, this East Louisiana uh, facility, okay, in Jackson, Louisiana. And uh, there's a doctor there. He was a psychiatrist uh, at that time working uh, there. And he was interviewed before he died. And they, they, they asked silly questions like this. Well, doctor, you know, Dr. Fred Silva, uh, we hear that you were doing experiments out here with prisoners. And, um, you know, they were volunteers from Angola prison. And, and he said, no, I was just working with interns. We didn't do any experiments. But I have a paper that he published, okay, along with Dr. Robert Heath from Tulane, where you see they were, were injecting prisoners from Angola, okay, with uh, psychedelic drugs, testing them. I mean, that's a published paper. And under the table, they were doing a lot more. And that, that, that uh, it, it really gets to me that people will say, well, Dr. Silva, what's he going to say? Dr. Silva's going to say, oh, yes, we were experimenting with people and not telling them what we were doing with them. They, we were injecting them with cancer. We're not going to, uh, you know, we want everybody to know that. It's not like that. Okay, so I have the records. William Livesay was there in 1963. Others have reported to me that they were involved in various experiments. So when people say, oh, come on, you mean you were injecting cancerous materials in people at Jackson? You bet. And I have to tell you, though, that I got out of that experiment when I found out that the people that, at least one that they were using, was not informed. I was originally told that these prisoners had terminal illnesses, cancers, and so we can go ahead and inject them with the, the material that we had been developing. Now, I got in that project a little late. It, it started April 23, 1962, and I have some peripheral suggestions. Mean, we have some, a lot of circumstantial evidence, you know, as, as to what was going on. Plus, we have um, Edward Haslam for at least two decades. Edward knew Dr. Mary Sherman, who was viciously murdered on July 21st, 1964, when the Warren Commission came to get testimonies. And because something's funny going on in New Orleans, so funny that they, that we have Jim Garrison going after Clay Shaw and getting international attention because of that. Of course, they crucified Garrison. But we have wonderful records, wonderful evidence um, that if Garrison hadn't done that, we wouldn't have probably the Zubruder film available where it shows Kennedy's head being violently thrust backward. That shot had to come from the front. Lee Oswald is, from, is behind. You can't shoot somebody in the back of the head and have their head go backward. So there's so many lies that Lee Oswald did this. He was facilitating our work out there, and there was, it's so complicated. We're talking about 600 pages of information. It's got, I saved documents. I saved uh, all kinds of things. We have uh, the stories of all the people that were involved, and they can't fight the book because it's all backed up with fact. Anyway, there I was uh, ordered to make cancer more deadly, and I did my work. I had no idea that we were going to use this on humans. I was told originally that if we find out what makes cancer more deadly, we'll be able to figure out maybe how to kill it. So that's how I was lured into this. I come to New Orleans two weeks early. Um, the doctors were out of town. They were uh, in um, South America. We've got the records for that, for Dr. Oxner, and we believe that Mary Sherman was with him because she was fluent in Spanish and um, was one of the few people who was involved as he was. Uh, with what were people. you told uh, you were going to be doing in, in New Orleans? I was told that I would be getting, uh, going to be able to skip two years of college and go straight into medical school, but I needed to have this internship with Dr. Mary Sherman. And I said, you know, Dr. Mary Sherman was brutally mu murdered. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's uh, Warren Commission couldn't talk to her. She was front page news. Uh, there was nothing wrong with her when I saw her, except she wasn't there the first two weeks. I got there early because our school had gone onto the, the trimester system. It got out early, and they didn't know that. They sent me a bus ticket. I thought I was supposed to come right away. I should have waited two weeks, but I really didn't have anywhere to go. So I come, and there's nobody there. And um, I had a fiancé who said, mm, maybe I'll come marry you. You know, I think I will. Maybe I've got to talk. You know, I've got to do this, but not get my parents mad at me because you're a Catholic. And I was an atheist at the time. But, you know, I was a Catholic, and they didn't like Catholics. So he didn't want anybody to know. So we're writing these letter, letter back and forth, you know. And, 
One of them was a code that said, Jario to Jaria, you know, please write, I'm okay, and signed J.A. And that was Judith Ann, that was for me. Now, I'd like to jump quickly ahead. When you have a telephone call coming from a woman just a couple days before the Kennedy assassination to Lee Oswald in the Texas School Book Depository, a person they said had no accent, who asked for Lee Oswald, the new janitor. The code word was J-A there, the first two letters in janitor. He was a clerk there. He wasn't a janitor. But he knew it was me, and then he was able to call me back. So we had our last conversation, only 37 and a half hours before the assassination. Lee told me he was part of a... Sometimes it's really hard for me to talk about this, all right? He gave his life. He found a way to penetrate... um, the ring, the assassination ring. You'll find out all of the details, not only in this book, but also in Dr. Mary's Monkey. But go to meandlee.com, and, and uh, you'll see also information there, some of the files and things. They're right on the site there. So anyway, Lee is talking to me, and, you know, he says, uh, yeah, I, I finally have gotten in, uh, you know, in so close in this group by pretending he didn't like Kennedy. But he said, there's something the matter, he said. You know, I, of course, they, they think I'm going to shoot, and I would never shoot at Kennedy. Because I said, please get out of there. And he said, well, if he did, they'd just replace him. He said, if I stay, that will be one less bullet aimed at Kennedy. That's the first thing he did. And then he told me that he had become a member of, what, of, of an abort team. He told me that he had saved Kennedy's life previously already. When I told people this in 1999, it's taken a while for people to understand that I'm getting my witnesses. I have people verifying what I've said. In 1999, I didn't have that. So when I said that Lee told me that he believed he saved Kennedy's life, okay, in another city, uh, people were almost said, oh, come on, maybe he was a patsy and he was all this, but come on, save Kennedy's life. You know, this man, I mean, he had been in the USSR after all. He was handing out pro, you know, he may have been framed, but God, how in the world could he have helped and save Kennedy's life in any way? We have Abraham Bolden in a very respected book, JFK and the Unspeakable by James Douglas, an excellent book, the best book on the assassination. It shows the treason of the generals. It shows how Kennedy was being surrounded by enemies from every side. And... um, Some of those enemies actually went on the Warren Commission, like Alan Dulles. He was fired. He was the head of the CIA. Kennedy fires him. And this fox here is telling us what happened in the hen house, all right, when Kennedy died. He's investigating. Uh, They were told right from the beginning, with what's called the Katzenbach Memo, we have to convince the American people that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Just a couple, just a couple days after the assassination. Lee himself is dead 47 hours after Kennedy's, I mean, after he's arrested, which was only 69 minutes after Kennedy was shot. And we have that arrest form. It's filled out at 1.40 p.m. when they arrested him at a Texas theater, you know. (laughs) They have four police who have signed this document, and it says this man shot and killed Kennedy. President John F. Kennedy, and he shot and killed uh, Officer J.D. Tippett, and he wounded John Connolly. This is before he's been properly searched. We know that because um, we've got two wallets they find for Lee Oswald, one at the Tippett scene that disappears because the other wallet, they find, you know, when they uh, take it out of his pocket when he's in the car there, you can't have two wallets, so one disappears, Okay. It's very, very sad to see what they did to Lee Oswald and how quickly they framed him. And uh, uh, even retouched photos and flip photos to make him look funny and blew, uh, blew up a big smile. They've, actually, you can, when you blow up the photos, you can see how his mouth is going like this, but they retouch it to make it go up like that. So he's got this crazy grin on his face. Of course, then everybody's going to hate him. Anyway, Lee told me, that he, had, he was a member of an abort team. We have James Douglas, who has interviewed a wonderful man. His name is Abraham Bolden, the first black Secret Service man. He has written the book Echo from Dealey Plaza. He tried to save Kennedy. He tried to tell people. Um, he went to top 
people and was saying things like, uh, look, the Secret Service was lax. I remember the Secret Service. These men were lax in taking care of Kennedy. He did not order them off the car and so on. They put him in prison and they filled him with drugs. They put him in a psychiatric ward and uh, he's still trying to get, um, he's, he's been an honorable man all his life. And uh, when he finally got released, um, his story is really worth listening to. He tried to tell them that a man named Lee saved Kennedy's life in Chicago. They didn't want that to come out. There aren't that many Lees in the world, you know. And as for Lee, when I asked him, did you think you saved Kennedy's life? And he said, I believe I did. We know that armed men were arrested in Chicago three weeks before Kennedy finally died. Kennedy was going to get on his plane. He was stopped at the last minute before reaching. There's a man named Valley, V-A-L-L-E-E. It looks like he was being set up to be the patsy if they had managed to kill Kennedy in Chicago. We have Mary Sherman working. We were trying to save Kennedy's life by then. Uh, just And uh, Dr. Mary Sherman was from Chicago. She had contacts there. It's all complex. This is why this case hasn't been solved all these years. But because the people are very powerful who are involved, every year you see highly financed films coming out trying to prove one more time that Lee Oswald did it. And... <laughs> They, the reason they keep coming out with new ones is because, of course, honest researchers show what's wrong with the silly things that they put together trying to prove their point. You have, there's so much I could say about that, and I'm going to have a lot of that in the presentation. So Lee is telling me he saved Kennedy's life. I tell people in 1999, and, you know, I'm hooted out of the room. It's not happening anymore because I have so many witnesses, so many documents, and so much that it now corroborates everything I've been saying. And I have enough passion, and I'm not scared anymore. Once you hit 70, I mean, I'll just put it this way. I don't care what happens to me anymore. I want people to know the truth. Well, people can still understand that we might be able to do something to to get our country back on track where it belongs. Because when you have this kind of thing going on, you have the wrong people taking control of the country. They didn't like Kennedy. I, I've got a photo showing Lyndon Johnson staring at Kennedy with so much unmitigated hatred that it's just like he's putting shooting arrows at him. The, there are many books out about who Lyndon Johnson really was and his desire to become president. Now, Lee didn't say that, Lee, that uh, Lyndon Johnson did it or was going to do it. He said that because of the scandal of Bobby Baker and Billy Solestes that he would go along with the assassination. That's pretty bad. And we have Madeline Brown, and I lived in, in, in Texas. She was the mistress of LBJ, and she's on record. And they've tried to, to say, oh, she was never the mistress, or she's lying. She had no reason to say that when she went to this party, and they've tried to obscure uh, the facts about where this happened and when it happened and so on. She's, she was an older lady, of course, by the time she was interviewed. But she... Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that what she said should resonate. And that is, Lyndon Johnson comes out from this meeting, and he says, after tomorrow, those damn Kennedys are not going to embarrass me anymore. That's not a threat. That's a promise. And she loved him. Oh, yeah, I mean, she had a son by him. I lived in Texas almost 18 years and returned to Texas later. That was stupid because I ended up in the hospital twice in Texas trying to find um, witnesses, you know, to support some, because I knew some of the people there. Uh, Not a safe place to go. Not if you're me. I'll put it that way. Anyway, Lee Oswald, 37 and a half hours before the assassination, says he is a member of an abort team. I told this to Jim Mars near the end of 1999 or early in 2000. And he's looking at, I have these stacks of evidence. He's looking, he's been spending hours looking at this, you know. We're in a restaurant where they'd like us probably kick us out. We've been there all day, you know. And he's, and then I said, you know, Lee said he was a member of an abort team. And, you know, apparently they just couldn't get there in time because Kennedy got, died. The, not everybody in the CIA is awful. Some of the people who learned of this were trying to protect Kennedy. That's why he lived an extra few weeks, because people did respond when Lee gave them information, for example. 
Jim Mars almost fell off his seat. He said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean, abort team? He says, nobody knows about this. It's not in the record. It's not anywhere. How, where did you get that idea? And I said, well, Lee told me. And I explained everything. And he said, I just interviewed someone. His name is Tosh Plumley, CIA pilot. He says there was an abort team. But that's never gotten out. In fact, Tosh Plumley's book still hasn't gotten out. Most of those people are dead. But uh, Jim Mars then started looking seriously at, at the outrageous claims I had, you know. And as he looked and I showed him, I had saved everything from 1963. I had even streetcar tickets that showed, you know, the dates when Lee and I went places that were important. And um, I had bus tickets. I had all my Riley checks. It showed that we were hired the very same day. Had a little small subsidiary of a bigger company. And there our records got laundered because... I was doing cancer research. What am I doing as the secretary for the vice president of Riley Coffee Company when I could, well, I could type, but you wouldn't want to have any of those letters on your, come, going out to anybody, you know. I have, uh, it was absurd. But so we were hired, these were cover jobs. And on top of that, when Lee's going out somewhere, like he'd go to Bannister's office or something like that, people couldn't find him. We had to protect him from getting fired. He was there 11 weeks, and he was almost never there. So you have Lee Oswald clocking in at maybe 8.31, and another time at 9.45, and another time at 8.30, and another time at, at uh, 9.31, and so on. He's being clocked out at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, or 5.30, right on the nose. And that's because I didn't want to sit around. As the secretary to the vice president, I would take his card and clock him out. And they had to all move away when I did it. See, I got to go it right on the nose like that. Even though they had like 90 employees standing in line to clock out, you know, at 5 o'clock or 5.30, I got in there first because I was the vice president's secretary. So I clocked him out and put the card back. It's just, you know, right there you have some statistics to work with. But on top of that, Lee Oswald and I were transferred one week later to Riley, same day also. We lit, we moved into our apartments the same week. We arrived in New Orleans the same week. And we rode the bus because we had no other transportation, the same bus. We lived only one bus stop apart. And so for 11 weeks, we're riding back and forth on the magazine bus, sitting together. And I have to say, since, I mean, he got on first and I got on second, he would notice, I think, who was sitting there. And I looked pretty cute back then, okay? And I like, I'm a talkative person. I was sociable. I didn't sit there, you know, sucking my thumb. I talked to people. So even if you didn't believe that we knew each other, and we did, before the jobs were arranged, there's no possible way when we got off at the same bus stop to go to work at the same company that he wouldn't notice who I was. And, of course, I learned all about him even before that. Now, Lee Oswald was f fired in July from Riley Coffee Company. The day he was fired, they, we have it. Put an ad out to replace me because I'm no longer needed. I don't have to clock him out. I don't have to prove his time cards. They were in terrible condition. They said, did this man make 40 hours, you know? And one of the vice president's jobs was for not only finance and working with field agents, but with security. So they, when they had disputes, my initial J is on the time cards, most of them. A majority of them. Some of them have been erased. Recently, we went to the Mary Farrell Foundation's site, and the cards that we have shown to people from the National Archives at 60 Minutes also had copies of showing my J's. They have erased the J's. So in my presentation, I show what they look like before they erase. So they've gone along, and they have erased my presence from a lot of things that were there, even in new books. They've erased those uh, hints that show that I was working with Lee Oswald. That was on his time cards. I've got them. They're in the book. Okay, so then the day that Lee is arrested, um, I was supposed to work until the end of August after they tried to replace me because I had to train somebody to take my place. But on August 9th, I didn't get to stay till August 15th. On August 9th, uh, Lee is arrested. But because I had been seen with him prior to his arrest, I was fired that day. So I have a check showing that the day he was arrested, okay, I got, I got fired. I got my last check. 
and it was horrible. It was um, ten bucks. <laughs> you know, it was not very much money. And they. Um, but were you still working with uh, doing the cancer research at that point? This, these were cover jobs. Right. Um, I would be there in the mornings at Riley's, and on Mondays and Tuesdays I would be there. On on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, also often on Saturdays, if because Dave Ferry was out of town a lot, going to Miami, to um, this is where I was doing a lot of work with an associate of he wasn't a doctor, but he was hideable just like I was. I wasn't a doctor. They had this ring set up, and I was one of the few people who had been trained who wasn't a doctor and who could, wouldn't be uh, traceable, who could handle deadly viruses and the things they were working with. Dave Ferry had to be out of town a lot because he was trying to get his job back with Eastern Airlines. And uh, Bannister went down there and other people that are important you'll read about in the book, okay, trying to help him save his job. So on on a number of Saturdays, I was also working there, and we were processing. You've got to think of it like this. I could give mice cancer in seven days. That's That's what the doctors learn when they work with me. We are now working with mice in seven days with a cancer that's so deadly, and that's what they've been working on ever since 1962, that in seven days, the the cancer would be as big as the mouse itself. We were harvesting the biggest of them, and this had to be done very carefully. You don't want ordinary people handling this material. It's deadly. Uh, We're harvesting this material, and it's being taken to the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, Edward Haslam has proven, now we'll put it this way, indicated, Uh, He has people who have assured him that they installed the equipment necessary to make mega important doses of radiation uh, on this material. And it was mutating all different directions. It was just being injected back into more mice. uh, And the fastest growing stuff, we kept taking it. And it was faster and faster. And we're talking about hundreds of mice. It didn't matter. They came from all over the place because most mutations are deadly or they, they're, they don't do anything or they're negative even. But since we're after cancer, cancer, uh, you can give people a lot of x-rays and they can get cancer from it. That's a fact. People don't realize that when you get radiation treatment and you have cancer, it can give you cancer. So these are things people should know. And it is my hope that the cancer industry will stop being a cancer treatment industry and be a cancer cure industry. It's about time. It's ridiculous, but of course it won't make as much money. There will be a lot of people out of work if we cure cancer. Back in 1961, 62, 63, we were working with viruses and vaccines at that time. They actually took a vaccine to the Pope who was dying of stomach cancer, but it was too late. Now, I don't know whether that vaccine would have worked, but we haven't gone in that direction again until recently when they did the human papilloma virus vaccine. All right. So we know that vac- certain vaccines can cure certain cancers. Why have we had to wait 40 years while people are spending 300000 400000 to save their lives on, by getting cut, getting poisoned, and getting burned? And that's what the, way, the medieval way that cancer is being handled when uh, there are many other ways that could have been used. And they've even shut down. People have tried other ways. They do not want this to get out to the public. And that's, that. I think, some of the reason that I had so many threats is because I know what we could have done back then. It's even bigger than the Kennedy assassination. When you realize how many people have suffered from cancer and all we get are more toxic drugs, uh, they're even delivering some of these drugs with nano packets, they're using bacteriophage to go into the system, find the, the cancerous material, and in, they inject these little viruses, inject these teeny packets of chemotherapy, okay, chemotherapeutic drugs, into the cancer. I ask you, why aren't they using these viruses to attack the cancer itself instead of delivering expensive packages of chemo when you can engineer, and we're able to do it, viruses to actually person, you know, attack it. Then uh, after it's attacked, the viruses would stay in your system. And if you had a recurrence, it'd wake up again and attack it again. That's what inoculations are all about, these vaccines. They work and they'll keep working. But my goodness, we're going to lose an awful lot of money. We're going to have to shut down all those radiation centers. We're going to have to shut down all those um, uh, chemical plants that are making toxic materials. 
we're going to have to, to uh, a lot of specialists will be out of jobs. Or maybe we just will not invent the light bulb and we'll keep using candles for the rest of eternity. Okay. So you spoke to him on uh, by phone 37 hours before yes. he was... Uh, yes, and, and at that shoot. time, you know, he said, and they, they want me to shoot. He says, Judefke, you may think I'm a good shot, you know. I'm not that good. So he understood that he, he had a problem. He thought he would be shot dead and a rifle would be placed in his hands. Consider human beings, please. If this man is so intelligent that he was... You know, prolific. he was proficient and absolutely fluent in Russian. And he was able to sneak around and sneak a rifle in and do all these things. How come he's so stupid that he shoots from his own workplace where everybody can identify him? Why, it's lunchtime. Why doesn't he go to any of the other buildings in that fishbowl, like the Deltex building? Shoot from there and then nobody knows him there. No, this man is so stupid, okay, that after he shoots... Kennedy, he leaves the rifle behind, you know, right where it can be found, you know, on the same floor, no less, you know. Uh, he goes and escapes by using a bus, escapes, uh, instead of going out of town, he's supposed to have gotten into a taxi cab at the bus station, the Greyhound bus station, where he had enough money in his pocket to go all the way to Mexico City. He doesn't get on one of those buses. He goes to the movies, and he's moving from seat to seat. Leet Oswald told me that when he was in the Soviet Union, okay, that he had to attend a film of an opera called The Queen of Spades, and he would find information or messages taped under the seats, and he knew which seat to move. You have Lee Oswald moving from seat to seat to seat. It's not the same seat. What is he doing there? And, of course, they get him. Now, the reason, um, you know, I'm saying um, what, what was Lee doing there, all right? Lee had infiltrated this group. And he did save Kennedy's life, I am convinced, in Chicago. There's so much to say, and of course, we can't do much in an hour. That's why I hope people will get the book, Me and Lee. And many are. The book, um, they've tried to <laughs> say things like, I sell $400 mutt dogs, you know, 20 years ago, therefore I'm a bad person. And we were raising guide dogs for the blind. They don't mention that. And, and those were vol voluntary donations. So, I mean, it's... It's terrible that it will try to do character assassination. So who uh, are these or people? what organizations do you believe carried out the assassination? This is a complex matter. Um, for example, I already think I've mentioned that and the board team, we believe, had a CIA. Uh, we know it's at least one CIA pilot was involved. And um, he's been intimidated, by the way. And... There are a lot of, he hasn't even spoken out very much, and news groups have crucified him and me, of course. Um, it looks like we have generals that are very angry. We have Cabell. General Cabell, for example, was fired by, by uh, Kennedy. His brother is the mayor of Dallas, so you have a nice nexus there going on. He had even been the police chief in Dallas before he was mayor. Okay? We know that we have Clint Murkison. We have uh, Oxner, who hated Kennedy hated Kennedy, yet somehow became in charge of Kennedy's trip to New Orleans in 1962. So these people are getting close to Kennedy. And we have the Secret Service stand down. It's famous. Even though we have a book out there saying that Kennedy ordered, we, uh, you know, the people off his car, the Secret Service, that's not true. We have Vincent Palomara, who's come out. It's, it's, uh, he got all, everybody on tape and film before they changed their story. And there you see there, you know, you've got tape and uh, interviews saying, no, Kennedy let us do whatever we wanted. And, and he didn't have the right to order anybody off a car who's in Secret Service. That's their decision, not his. So we have films showing them jump. Get, they're getting off the car. They go, what? Why, why, do we, why are we supposed to get off? We have these black cars. that are, Kennedy's the second car in this whole cavalcade. When have you heard of a president with, without, you know, without being buried in the middle of a cavalcade. No, he's the second vehicle, can you imagine? Behind him, when have you ever heard of the vice president and the president being in the same cavalcade? One bomb could have gotten rid of them. Why do we have Lyndon Johnson ducking and Secret Service agents jumping on top of him to protect him? Nobody moves in Kennedy's car to help him. The only one that is is a Secret Service agent that was attached to Mrs. Kennedy. He jumps onto the car from the back. 
why is it that these cars are black and Lyndon Johnson's car is blue? A bright blue, hey, don't shoot me. Why is it that when Lee Oswald is taken out to be shot by Jack Ruby, transferred, you know, Jack Ruby comes up, why is it that Lavelle, the detective that's with him, why is he in, the only guy there in a white suit? Hey, don't shoot me. There's so much there. And we have a lot of people cooperating, I believe, because so many hated him, Kennedy. We even have Kennedy, you know, creating um, U.S. Treasury notes. These are not Federal Reserve notes. Most of them are completely gone now, okay? $5 billion worth. He was creating money that we didn't have to pay people to print. It was our money. Yeah, so what do, who do we have on the Warren Commission? The former president of the World Bank. He's on the Warren Commission. So we have the enemies of Kennedy. Money. It's, it's, it stuns me how much they've been able to get away with. And we lost a great man who couldn't be bought off. He was independently wealthy. And even though he was elected by some of the mafia, his brother was going after the mafia and putting him in prison. So you have the mafia willing to help. You can get these agencies, and they will use people like the mafia so that they can plausibly deny. Today, we need to know that we have good leaders, statesmen, not politicians. But we have to see where they came from. This power has been handed down, and some of these are that were back there, uh, active, still alive today. Arlen Specter just died. This man invented the magic bullet. Gerald Ford, who became president by, not by election, but by appointment by a crooked president, Nixon, all right, who was in Dallas on the 22nd when Kennedy was killed. That man moved the bullet hole up more than four inches from where the Secret Service and the FBI said it was located because otherwise Lee Oswald's bullet could not possibly have gone through Kennedy's neck. So I hope people will see the presentation that we're going to have at the convention center here. And um, I'm, I'm going to repeat that, uh, that convention center. That's at in room 201, Washington State Convention Center, 730. It's going to be November 20th, Tuesday. So I pray that people will come learn the truth while I'm still alive to tell you. All right. Well, with that, we are... Unfortunately, out of time, I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time well, with us Well, you're today. welcome. You know, I'm an artist, and I'm going to give you a little present. This is a picture of Lee, not a monster. He's about ready to, to wink. He liked to tell jokes. Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you the truth. Again, talking with Judith Ferry Baker, author of the book Me and Lee, How I Came to Know, Love, and and lose Lee Harvey Oswald, and you can find out further information via their site, meandlee.com. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.